Well, good afternoon and welcome to Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase, our weekly call in town hall. I'm State Senator Amanda Chase, your weekly radio show host. And uh, the district I serve includes all of Colonial Heights, all of Amelia, and most of Chesterfield. I would also like to thank WNTW 820 AM, The Answer, for the opportunity to provide this free public service to you each and every Thursday. If you have a question about today's topic, I invite you to call in. Today we're going to continue talking about hot topics and bills that came up during the 2017 legislative session. And I have a great update for you on Senate Bill 1398, which is a bill regarding an act to require evaluation of closure of coal combustion residual units. And that was patroned by Senator Scott Cervell and myself. And we just received uh, really great news, which I can't wait to share with you today, since we were last on the air this past Thursday regarding those amendments that we requested from the governor. You'll have to stay tuned to listen to that. Um, you know, most people are surprised to see a Republican get involved with what's considered an environmental issue, and I'm not sure why. Um, I do agree that the EPA tends to overregulate, as we've seen with stormwater management over the past eight years. Uh, that said, we should all be good stewards of the land and resources that we have. Um, I think this is this particular issue is a bipartisan issue, as uh, Republicans and Democrats alike both like to enjoy the water, swimming, canoeing. And the fact that this Chesterfield power plant is right next door to a public park requires us to elevate this particular location. Look at it a little bit more closely, in my opinion. Um, we, we really can't afford to get this wrong. Um, the, the negative consequences would just be too great. And uh, we're going to discuss this in more detail in just a bit. Um, you know, those of you who are just tuning in for the first time, um, I like to give you a little bit of information about myself. I'm a wife. I'm a mom. My husband and I have owned businesses over the years. We currently have, um, our boys have a grass cutting business and we have a financial services business. Um, personally, I'm also a Christian, conservative, Republican, and in that order, and I'll bar that line from Vice President Mike Pence. Though I will say, and many can vouch, I do vote my conscience, and I don't necessarily follow party lines. I would like to think that I weigh every issue on its own merits and I really do try to do my best to listen all to all the stakeholders and make sure that everyone's brought to the table before forming decisions or drafting policies on issues. Um, that, that can frustrate sometimes people, but um, I, I like to think things through and like to hear um, all sides of an issue. I'm also known for not being politically correct. Now, some of you may like that, some of you may not. But I strive hard to do my research on issues listen to constituents, and base decisions and votes on what I feel is the right thing to do, regardless of how it affects me politically. Um, I'm both a fiscal and a social conservative, but I focus on issues and topics which I feel affect most people in the district and are generally bipartisan in nature. I also would like to encourage you to write down the phone number here to the studio and to call in. Our number is 804 Four five four one three six six, and we're going to do our best to answer your question on the show. And if you don't want to call in but have an issue or concern, feel free to reach out to my office. We understand not everybody likes to call in, um, but I'm still in my office each Tuesday and Thursday, even out of session. And um, my in, my contact information is actually on my website, amandachaseforsenate.com. So what is the purpose of this weekly town hall? Really, it's to provide constituents an opportunity to learn about what's really going on in their state government. It's also an opportunity for me to listen to you and to hear what concerns you have so that I can carry those issues back to Richmond. We, we are all part-time legislators with life outside of the annual winter session, which takes place at our state's capital in Richmond, Virginia, January through March with one or two day con reconvene in April, which is coming up in two weeks. And uh, sometimes the governor will call us back into session in the off season, but this has not happened since I've been in office for a whole um, year and a half. But um, we're usually busiest during the winter season. I, I, don't, I don't think people really realize, like, like if I were to go quiz people off of the street here, you know, they think that we're in session year round. And that's true for Congress at the U.S. level. But at the state Senate and in the state legislature, we're busiest during the winter session. And this is when we focus on drafting, reviewing, 
reading and passing legislation. This is also when we meet with constituents. We have many guests who come and visit us regarding specific issues. But even when we're out of session, we continue to handle constituent services to address specific issues, um, those in our district. Um, I also attend many community events. Uh, many of you may have seen me at a Chamber of Commerce meeting or a Ruritan group. I was at a grand opening last night of a new car dealership in Chester, uh, Colonial Subaru. Uh, um, so new businesses opening up. Um, I, I try to go to parades when I'm invited and um, other meetings. You know, just try to stay in touch with the people of our district. If you live in the district and you'd like for me to come to speak to your group, please also give my office a call. Happy to do that as our schedule allows. But um, I am very thankful that I'm a state legislator and that I don't work in D.C. because we're able to stay in our district most of the year, which I personally think helps us to stay connected to those who've elected us. Many of the issues, as you all who've listened to us week after week, know that we discuss issues on cut to the chase. And most of those come from meeting with constituents on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we hope that you're going to tune in each Thursday um, to our weekly town hall to find out what the hot issues are in our area. Now, as I mentioned last week, the bills that passed both the House and the Senate are now on the governor's desk waiting to be signed. And um, he's going through the process now, vetoing and um, offering amendments on some bills and uh, signing others. On Wednesday, April the 5th is when we reconvene, if you want to write that date on your calendar. And uh, we're going to have the opportunity to override any governor vetoes with two-thirds of the veto. I'm just going to tell you straight up, um, it's going to be very difficult in the legislature. We have um, in the Senate a 21 to 19 split, 21 Republicans and 19 Democrats. So that's going to be very difficult. The governor also has the opportunity to offer amendments to our bills, and the legislature will vote to accept or reject those amendments. Um, the coal ash bill is one such bill that I hope the General Assembly will agree to vote to accept the governor's amendments. And that, my friends, is my good news today. Earlier this week, I received news from the governor's office that the governor approved the general purpose of Senate Bill 1398, which, as we said earlier, is a bill requiring evaluation of closure of coal combustion residual units and return the bill to the General Assembly with amendments, and those will come up again in a couple weeks. These amendments are amendments that both Senator Surabell and I requested. And if you missed last week, I really encourage you to go back to my website, amandachaseforsenate.com, and go listen to last week's show as Jamie Brunkow, who is the lower river keeper of the James River Association and the featured story on the front page of the Richmond Times Dispatch Sunday, March 12 issue. And uh, Senator Scott Serville, who is the original patron of Senate Bill 1398, and I discuss at great length real concerns about contamination and the necessity for these reports. And um, I once again want to thank them both for being on last week's show. And um, so let's just talk about it today. So what are these governor's amendments? What do we propose? There are actually four of them, and um, I'm supportive of all four of them, um, and, and here they are. The first one is the governor has moved up the date as to when the assessment would be due. Now, what does that mean? He moved it up from January 1st, 2018 to December 1st of 2017 by a, by a month, which oddly enough is my birthday, so that's certainly a nice surprise. I am supportive of this measure as it will allow us time to draft any needed legislation prior to the 2015 General Assembly session in the event that we would need to act on any findings in the year-long study that will be conducted. So I think it's very forward-thinking, and in my opinion, this is a great amendment and will give us time to um, tweak things and make, make sure that if there are any issues, we can address those in the General Assembly. The second amendment is that instead of having to issue a progress report on the evaluation, the evaluation now has to be complete. It then must be reported to the chairman of the House Committee on Agriculture, 
Chesapeake and Natural Resources and the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Conversation, Conservation and Natural Resources. And finally, to the Department of Environmental Quality and Conservation and Recreation. Once again, I think this is a good amendment, and um, as the report must be complete, which gives us the opportunity to not to just receive a progress update, but a final report on which we can take action. Um, we're going to come back from the break in just a minute. We're going to talk about the other two amendments, Amendments 3 and Amendments 4. And um, you'll want to stay tuned and, and listen to that. Again, take down the number 804-454-1366. We'll be right back. Well, thanks for tuning in today to Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase. I'm your state senator, Amanda Chase, and today we are talking about the governor's amendments that um, Senator Cervell and I asked him to submit on uh, behalf of our districts. And um, we're talking about those amendments. We've talked about the first two, and I'm going to talk to you about the last two. And then I'm going to go to Adrian Catola, who is the Government Affairs and Policy manager with the James River Association. So you want to definitely um, stay tuned. She's going to be bringing to you um, news that has just apparently broken um, in, in a situation in Chesapeake regarding coal ash. And so please stay tuned to that. So let's go ahead and pick up with a third amendment. Um, in my opinion, this is the most significant amendment. And it's one that states that the director of the Department of Environmental Quality shall suspend and not was taken out, okay? So they shall suspend, delay, or defer the issuance of any permit to provide for the closure of any CCR unit. You see, the original language stated that the DEQ shall not suspend, delay, or defer the issuance of any permit to provide for the closure of any CCR unit. You know, it's amazing how significant one word <laughs> Striking one word can can make a big difference. And notice that it says shall and not made. That means that the DEQ is not going to be allowed to issue these permits. So without the amendment, the director of the DEQ would have been allowed to issue solid waste permits regarding, regardless of the re report findings, which, in my honest opinion, did not make any sense. Why would you wait with until an evaluation was done before you proceeded with corrective measures? Um, keep in mind that every time a corrective measure is done, that the State Corporation Commission allows Dominion to pass that cost on to you, the ratepayer. It's not Dominion picking up the cost, friends. It's you, the ratepayer, that's going to pay that. So that's why um, I guess I've been adamant about making sure that we get it right the first time, that we know the cost going into this, and um, we know the remediation before we sp spend any more money. Because nobody likes to pay for something twice. As a mom of four, I know I don't. Uh, the Fourth Amendment suspends the issuance of any permit regarding closure of CCR units until May the 1st of 2018 or the effective date of any legislation adopted during the 2018 General Session of the General Assembly that addresses the closure of the CCR unit in Virginia, whichever occurs later. So the earliest the director of the DEQ could issue a permit is May the 1st of 2018. So it give us a, gives us a little time. Or the date set forth in any future legislation, it's the later of the two dates. So that's going to give us a little more time to come up with viable solutions, and I'm all about viable solutions. Um, then um, that said, I would have liked to have seen the public comment part added back in, but it was not. Uh, Senator Cerebell and myself are in discussions about holding our own public comment meetings across the state to listen to constituents throughout the upcoming year. And, of course, we always welcome your comments here on our weekly radio town hall. And the number, again, is 804-454-1366. And so please give us a call. Um, one thing that we do know for sure is that the General Assembly will reconvene on Wednesday, April the 5th, which is only two weeks away. And so before I forget, I want to encourage you to contact your state senator and your state delegate and ask them to vote yes on the governor's amendments on Wednesday, April the 5th. Now, I believe Adrian, is Adrian on the phone? Adrian, can you hear me okay? 
Yes, I'm here. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for um, uh, calling in. Uh, we spoke a little bit earlier today, and there's some late breaking news that I honestly have not had a chance to read over yet, but I know that you have. And so um, I appreciate you calling in to the station today to give us an update on the on the lawsuit in Chesapeake. No problem. Thank you for having me. Yes, a federal judge today ruled that um, Dominion Virginia Power's Chesapeake Power Station and the coal ash ponds there are actually in violation of the Clean Water Act because the ash is contaminating groundwater, which is then flowing into the nearby Elizabeth River. And I'll tell you why this is a really important decision. And the reason is that the situation where coal ash is contaminating groundwater and flowing into surface water at Chesapeake is not unique. That's exactly what we're seeing happen at the Chesterfield Power Station. That's exactly what's happening up at the Possum Point Power Station in Northern Virginia, as well as at the Primo Power Station upriver in Fluvanna County. Um, so this is an important decision, a groundbreaking decision for coal ash in Virginia. and it's very perfectly timed uh, right before the reconvened session in a couple of weeks because the rest of the judge's rulings essentially said that we need more information before we mm -hmm. decide what to do with these ponds at the end of the day. Before we close them, we need to do some more monitoring. Dominion needs to take a step back and look at other options as well as um, the plaintiffs, the Sierra Club in this case, need to take a step back and come up with other options for how we close these ponds when we know contamination is happening. Wow. Well, that is certainly significant information. And um, I, I noticed, I don't know if you saw um, today's Richmond Times Dispatch, but the front page of the Metro system, um, Metro page, it says the governor asked to halt the coal ash permits. And um, like you said, it's one, one of my concerns has been from the get-go is that, you know, certainly understanding, I mean, Dominion wants to comply with state and federal laws. They've been emphatic about that. Absolutely. And, um, we, you know, we certainly, you know, that's what we want them to do. We want them to follow the law. And so we as legislators have to ensure that the governing agency, which is the DEQ or the Department of Environmental Quality, is properly going out and measuring the appropriate um, criteria. So if we're measuring the wrong things, we're going to get the wrong results. We've got to make sure that we're measuring the, the methodology that we're using is consistent. You know, I, last week we were talking about in Chesterfield, we had three different tests that were done, two that were done by independent groups. Uh, you all, the James River Association, had done one, and then uh, there was a Duke-led university study done, and then one by DEQ. So, um, you know, three different tests done, two of them came back with contamination. And I know that there's disagreement between the EQ, Dominion, some, you know, uh, James River Association about that. I mean, there's just too many questions that are unanswered for us to go ahead and move forward with capping and sealing. So um, sealing uh, the coal ash ponds in place. So I, I do have to thank the governor for his leadership on uh, this particular bill and these amendments. We have one more minute before we, we go to the break. Adrian, is there anything else that you would like to add? I would like to thank you for all of your work on this issue and uh, second your request for constituents to reach out to their, to their legislators if they would like to see the governor's amendments adopted. And we'll certainly be there to ferry that effort along. Very good. Well, I appreciate you all bringing this to my attention. And um, we'll be back in just a few seconds. Adrian, thanks so much for um, coming on today. And uh, we will look forward. This is probably going to be a continuing issue. So stay tuned. You don't want to miss another segment. Welcome back to Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase, and I'm State Senator Amanda Chase, your weekly radio talk show host. And, um, you know, today we are <clears throat> addressing top issues that took place in the General Assembly, and coal ash has really um, 
been one of those. And um, I was just happened to be one of the patrons on that bill with Senator Cervell. It's been in the news a lot lately, um, again in the paper today. And I um, want to thank Adrian for calling with the James River Association just a few minutes ago, giving us an update on the lawsuit in Chesapeake. Um, I want to go back to a question that we get a lot. Um, several of you have asked, have we considered recycling the coal ash? And the answer is yes. Um, and it's actually already being done by Dominion, but it's also included in Senate Bill 1398 and specific language, which states to include an analysis of the impact that any responsible recycling or reuse options would have on such excavation or removal. Now, what does that mean? Um, we are looking at ways, you know, if you can sell recycled coal ash, you can offset the cost of excavation, which um, is, is actually pretty expensive. I mean, we know that it's going to be at least $3 billion. I mean, that is for complete excavation. Um, actually, it's not complete excavation. It's most of the, es they're, they're doing excavation and they're, they're hauling it out on trucks and that's not even complete excavation. It could be even more than that. Um, so let's just talk about recycling for just a minute. Um, Dominion currently recycles the bottom ash. Um, fly ash is actually the top ash, in case you didn't know. 30% of the coal ash is actually recycled. And to give you an idea, that's about 70, I'm sorry, 700,000 tons into various things. And you say, well, what can coal ash be recycled into? Well, have you heard of gypsum? It's, um, it's a component of sheetrock that we use in our homes. Um, silicon dioxide, uh, which is used in makeup, bowling balls, for instance, uh, concrete block, and cement. And actually, our very own VDOT, the Virginia Department of Transportation, buys any usable coal ash. It has to be a certain grade. Um, they're, they're buying it as well. Additionally, in order to protect the environment, we've been advised that um, lined sealed rail cars would need to be used, which currently are not being used in Virginia. The tracks that go into the Chesterfield plant are for transporting the coal to the plant which is not the same type of cars and tracks that would be needed for transfer of the ash out of the facility. And although our hope is to send it to a lined, currently operating lined Amelia landfill, which I plan to visit this year, neither of the major rail lines have tracks that go from Chesterfield plant to Amelia. So this would be a new project. And um, I just have to be completely honest with you. This is not a simple, there's not going to be a simple solution. Um, you know, my goal in this my bottom line in this is that before we act, we need to know the cost because that will be passed on to you, the rate, pa rate payer. So um, I just wanted to pass that along to you. And, um, you know, the as we mentioned earlier, to excavate the coal ash out of the unlined ponds and rail the coal ash out, um, we're talking about $3 billion. That, that's a lot of money. And um, certainly a very expensive option. So, you know, I have a question for you. Would you completely excavate the coal ash from the unlined coal ash ponds if it meant your power bill went up by 2%? That would be about $4 for every $100 that you spend. Let me know your thoughts. Give me a call, 804-454-1366. Um, I am going to move on to the other bill that I had that passed the House and the Senate, and that is Senate Bill 872, a bill regarding absentee voting application and ballots and photo identification uh, required required pass both the House and the Senate. Um, as we've discussed on the radio show, I serve on the Senate Privileges and Elections Committee chaired by Chairwoman Senator Jill Vogel. And she called for a joint meeting of the respective House and Senate Privileges and Election Committees where we heard concerns and complaints from local registrars across the state and they advised us that Veris, and just in case you didn't know, that's the state IT system that's used by the State Board of Elections to register new voters, update voter registration, handle voter absentee voting, and so forth. It, it kept going down. Um, it kept going down to the point some were concerned whether or not poll books would be ready on Election Day. And in a presidential year, it's, that's not good. <laughs> 
Um, specifically in Chesterfield, Registrar Larry Hakey advised in a report of three types of fraudulent voter registration applications that were identified in here in Chesterfield County. And uh, we're going to talk about those when we come back. Um, it's important that we protect the integrity of every legitimate vote. Every fraudulent vote cancels out a valid vote, and we just can't have that. So stay tuned. I'm going to talk about those examples of fraud here in Chesterfield. Stay tuned. Thanks again for tuning in today to Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase on AM 820 WNTW, The Answer. The call-in number again is 804-454-1366. Happy to take your call on the air if you want to call in. Uh, we're currently talking about a bill that um, I patroned, I, and uh, I would like to say that Delegate Buddy Fowler also patroned a similar bill in the House. And uh, there was a strategy involved with that. Um, especially in a short session, um, I have learned that if you have a House version of the same Senate version, uh, legislators have already heard the bill and you just have a higher likelihood of of getting the bill through in such a short time frame. So um, as I mentioned earlier, this bill, Senate Bill 872, requiring photo ID when voting absentee passed both the House and the Senate. However, it was vetoed by the governor. So um, I want to ask you, those of you who are listening in, is this a bill that you would like me to carry again next year? Before the break, I had mentioned Chesterfield Registrar Larry Hakey um, created a report, which he gave to me, and I'm very thankful for that because it's got a lot of valuable information in there. But there were he identified three types of fraudulent voter registration applications that were specifically identified in Chesterfield County, and I've seen those examples firsthand, and they're as follows. Um, The first one is sometimes we'll have an application with a fake name with a valid address. Um, We might have a completed application with a fake address. And um, finally, they see a lot of duplication of a valid application where the name and address were legitimate. So, friends, it's it's very important we, that we protect the integrity of every legitimate vote. Every fraudulent vote cancels out a valid vote, and we, and we simply just can't have that. The current state law requires that a valid picture ID, uh, uh, ha- that if you have a picture ID if you vote in person. Now, if you guys remember voting back for a presidential election, you had, if you went in person to your regular polling location, what did you have to show? to show a valid picture ID, a driver's license. Maybe you had, um, you know, another type of your military ID. However, no such requirement currently exists for those who vote absentee, creating a loophole in the law and an opportunity for fraud as voters do not have to present any type of photo ID. And and I figured this out with my daughter who... um, was in college and was voting absentee, and I just asked a simple question, well, you know, how did you comply with the current law of having to present a ID, a picture ID, if you're voting absentee? And she's like, well, I didn't have to present any type of photo ID. So I started doing some inquiring and calling the State Board of Elections and found out, lo and behold, they don't have to present any ID under the current law. Um, Senate Bill 872, if passed, would have closed this loophole. As I mentioned earlier, the governor vetoed it. Uh, This bill, if passed, would have required any voter submitting an application for an absentee ballot by mail, fax, or email to submit with his or her application a copy of one of the forms of identification that's acceptable under the current law. So we're just bringing the bill into compliance with it, it, I just think it's odd that you would have one law and it applies in two different circumstances. It's like in one case you don't have to file the law. Just That didn't make sense to me. Well, the bill does exempt military and overseas voter, and um, they're exempt by federal law under the MOVE Act uh, with persons with, a, with disabilities. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that said it is an improvement over the current law. Um, The bill would help address some of the concerns shared by registrars across the state 
There are actually over 50 known occurrences of voter registration fraud in the Commonwealth in 2016 alone. And according to our registrars, the problem is that the absentee ballot fraud is the easiest to go undetected. The bill would have actually brought consistency so that whether or not you are voting absentee in person or by mail, a photo ID would be required. It creates greater accountability and assurance that only eligible voters are affecting Virginia elections. And actually, both parties had concerns this year about outside entities affecting our elections. So bringing more accountability to the process, I think, would give us all greater assurance in the integrity of the process. I really do want to know what you think on this. Do you think we should close this loophole and require these those voting absentee to send in a copy of their valid photo identification? Um, I'm going to give you our number again. It's 804 454 one three six six, and let us know if you think this is a bill that that we should pursue again next session. We've talked about a lot of things on this show, um, especially today. We've we've talked a lot about coal ash. We've talked about voter identification. Um, there's so many things, so many issues that came up during the general assembly. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, um, we've we've talked about immigration, and um, we talked about the sanctuary. Uh, localities bill that no no locality shall adopt any ordinance procedure or policy that restricts the enforcement of federal immigration laws. And um, as I mentioned, I supported that bill, by the way. I was talking to a um, member on the board, uh, the school board this week um, in regards to immigration. And and I just want to emphasize this, that um, Republicans are for immigration. We are for legal immigration and um, localities, however, should not create safe havens for people who are not following the law. The locality should follow the law and do everything in its power to promote and protect the safety of its citizens. And, um, you know, it, as I was going back to our conversation, she was talking about, even in Chesterfield County, how we have situations of undocumented um, children who are in our classrooms and uh, you know, we we as uh, good natured folks, we, we want to take care of everybody, but it, it does put a strain on our resources. Um, I don't know if you saw in the paper this week where the uh, the school board members were talking about expanding resources in the area of giving um, additional assistance and help with those that speak English as a second language and, and needing more teachers and expanding our resources and our taxpayer money in those particular areas. So, you know, I was talking about, you know, compassion. You know, we we want to make sure, like I said, we love immigrants. We are America. We're the melting pot. But the message really should be clear. We have a process in place for people to come here legally. We encourage you to go through that process. Um, other countries have a similar process, and our country is, is no different. But it's now, like, affecting our schools and, and our kids who are there. So... We'll talk about this again. Stay tuned. We'll be back. I want to thank you again for joining us today on Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase on WNTW The Answer. I hope you will join us again next Thursday from 4 to 5 p.m. as we strive to address issues that are important to you. Um, I spoke with Congressman Dave Bratt a couple days ago, and you might mark on your calendar. He's going to be here on Thursday, April the 6th, and uh, we'll get an update on health care. I know that's a huge federal issue, but one that affects everyone in the district. Um, If you live in Chesterfield, Colonial Heights, or Amelia, I'm your state senator, and I will do whatever I can to help you. Um, The federal issues, um, depending on where you live in my district, either belong to Congressman Dave Bratt. or uh, uh, our new Congressman McEachin. So um, we, will, we will certainly do our best to help you, but just information for you. If you would like to receive notices of upcoming events, town halls, or my weekly newsletter, please visit my website at www.chaseforsenate.com and sign up. During session, I actually send out a weekly update each Friday, and out of session, 
we send out a monthly newsletter. There's, there's a lot that goes out on out of session as well. Or you can always join us each Thursday on our weekly town here. Paul here on WNTW 820, The Answer, on Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase. Um, we're going to have a lot of discussion about redistricting coming up. Um, there's, As you know, there's a Virginia 2021 lawsuit that's currently before us. I um, hope you've been reading up on that. And, you know, why is redistricting important, you say, and what is that? That is the drawing of the, the lines for who represents you in Congress, who represents you in the Senate, and who um, represents you in the, uh, in the House, of, House of Representatives, your delegate. So um, they base those lines on a number of things, but one of those includes the population. And so they take a look at this. They do a census every 10 years, and they will draw those lines. And so the Virginia 2021 has has challenged um, these findings in court, and the court is has agreed to to hear arguments, and um, they are specifically targeting and looking at um, Delegate Jimmy Massey's district right now. And so um, you know that's that's a concern for for a lot of people. And um, you know, I just want to say one thing about redistricting. You know, I think it's there's there's different arguments on different sides and we've talked about independent independent commissions and and I think I've expressed to you all how I feel about those. I mean, I definitely wish we could find people who are completely independent and understood redistricting and what that was because you do have to comply with federal legislation um uh different laws uh as far as compactness and the number of minorities in a district. So there are a lot of things that you have to take into account on that. So I think that'll be a, a really good topic that we discuss, uh, redistricting. So um, that'll be coming up next week. We'll continue to talk about hot issues that came up in the General Assembly in 2017. Until next week, stay tuned. <laughs>